I regard Highland as being one of the important, certainly one of the important films that I've ever had the, from the luck to do. The fortune, you know. It's a question of luck sometimes about what what you do and don't do, and that I've had made, made many films, as it turns out, and um, on the whole, I think I've been very lucky. But certainly, I would you know put Highland a high up among the the sort of uh, milestones. Highlander was a pretty interesting film at that stage in my career to wor work on. I think it was only the fourth or fifth film I designed. So it was uh, it was an interesting experience, vi an interesting visual experience. I, just, I, just I guess it must have been 1985. I was aware that they had been interviewing directors of photography to do this film with Russell Mulcahy. So I heard about that, and sure enough, I got a call, as did many others, and we, I went to an interview with Russell Mulcahy. But before I did that, I, I thought, well, I'd better have a look and see what he's done, because he had, he had made one film called Razorback, which I saw, and I thought, oh, well, this, is, this is really wild. So I was able to shift myself into a new area, the concept of the picture anyway. I mean, you can't have much reality with, uh, with that sort of subject. So that was in fact um, what we were permitted to do and rightly did, I think. Alan Cameron, who was a brilliant art director, he constructed sets, of course. Some of the things were done in actual real locations. Some of the things were done in sets. And of course the element of the set is come, becomes another one of those things which I say make up the whole film I mean that what gives the film its character well it was, it's quite an interesting experience really because I I'd heard that the film was going to be made and my family comes from the west coast of Scotland so I was quite intrigued in the title of the film Highlander and it was just one of those strange coincidences because I as I say I was pretty interested in the title and then suddenly I got a phone call to go and see Russell the director at Blake's Hotel, I seem to remember. Uh, I'd never met him before. I'd seen some of his pop promos, obviously, because he had a really good reputation for doing these pop promos. I think it was Duran Duran Wild Boy, I think it was called at the time, which was fantastic, with sort of windmills and very dark and moody, and, uh, and I liked the look of that. So when I got the phone call from him, I trundled off to Blake's Hotel and met Russell, who we got on pretty well and he gave me the script and I read the script and loved it and uh, about a week later he said would you like to do the film so that's how it started basically we had this available to us the Skycam system which is a highly complex system in the sense that um, it relies on pulleys being fixed in the roof on the four corners of this vast stadium uh, and there's cable running through the pulleys and the pulleys are being driven pulled and pushed and they're releasing one pulling another and that literally the camera which is hanging on a pod can be placed anywhere within that cube of space by a computer and um, it was flying through in fact it's in the picture because in one of the shots on the ground we had cameras all around we had nine cameras on that on that thing during this thing, and uh, the uh, one of the angles low on the ring. You see the sky cam travelling through the shot. I do. The audience don't. <laughs> it's actually there, and that was uh, that's a brilliant concept. Of course, Garrett Brown was the originator of. First of all, the steady cam, and then he developed it to a sky cam. Even there, we had to do it. We had, I had to improvise a trick quickly, because the, with the lens um, configuration available on that pod, we had a we wanted to have a wide angle to get the maximum effect after entering the tunnel of light to this noise and this shouted cheering and this exotic wrestling. Um, we wanted to go for, for a very wide view, we didn't get the wide shot. So the only way to, do, to fix it 
was again a technical um, thing to do, just a matter of thinking about it basically, was um, to use the wide angle, which would, in court, would of necessity mean the approach to him. It was quite fast, and it's a big heavy unit, and it would, it would literally, to finish the size we wanted, would finish up like one foot away from him. Well, that wouldn't have been a very suitable beginning to a picture by having that suddenly go overshoot its mark. You can imagine, it's like trying to stop a racing car. And um, so at any rate, we figured that we could manage to do it by having, they were, everybody was taking flash pictures. It wasn't our doing, they were already doing it. We didn't give people flash cameras. Um, so uh, by having a flash go off, we had we put one white frame in, and we then re re we do the same shot with the closer lens. And there is a point when the, it, it resembles the size and uh, of the approaching wide-angle shot, and you then finish up with the same dial same parameters. Um, with the with the white frame, you've gone from one to the other, and it's just you do it on the, one of the flashes because there was flash. Now that belongs originally. That whole concept of that belongs to Citizen Kane, because Wells knows in his innovative shooting of that picture. In the same way as Russell Mulcahy comes along, not not first of all not knowing what the uh, the. the <laughs> not knowing what the actual classic way to make a film is, as believed at that moment of time, but wanted to just do things. And he did a shot over a roof into a skylight and through the skylight. Well, he never did any such thing, of course, but it was one moment when they were approached to the point where the, the skylight was going to hit the camera. And then they took the skylight and the roof off and continued the shot and it was just a little fast dissolve. So it was the same same concept. That's what you have to do in, in film. You have to draw upon your resources and your resources are infinite. The film is quite structurally complex. You know, the various layers going back to the 17th century to, to the Second World War. So that was... It wasn't so much a challenge, it just made, made the job much more interesting. Because normally on a movie you only do one period, or if you're lucky, two periods, and combining all these different periods was made the film much more challenging. The challenge really was kind of seamlessly integrating the present-day New York into the Scottish Highlands. And Russell, Russell had some great ideas for those transitions, and I think two or three of them came off really well in the movie. But it was it was quite an interesting proposition, and it's an uh, interesting sequence because at the end of this whole battle, once, once I think it's McLeod's enemy is beheaded, the camera starts to rise up, and the, that particular garage had big concrete cross beams, which there was enough room for us to raise the camera up to the limit at which point we were within the, the actual ceiling part of the garage and um, we eventually finished up just before we hit the roof with a frame of a wall of a certain tonality and it was darker the darkness was a matter of controlling the light so it wasn't too brightly lit we actually just put a false beam in for it to go past so had to remember the tone and color and because they're, they're so similar you don't notice that the two are joined. At the time, it was quite an interesting transition, and it's been copied quite a few times since. There was actually a commercial on a couple of years after that blatantly copied the, the sequence. The cast itself in the loch and the bridge and is actually there. We just covered up modern things, took down TV aerials, took down telephone wires and telephone poles and things like that. So that particular castle was actually existing. So, as I say, when I actually first got this, this script, it was pretty exciting because I thought I could go back and see all the places I'd visited as a child. And I scouted. One of the great things about being a designer, you get to scout 
a huge amount of countries and countrysides and things like that. So we scouted a lot of the highlands looking for the locations. But we actually ended up within about 30 miles, most of the locations of where my family was, because it's just a very beautiful part of Scotland. One of the things that attracted me to Highlander as, a, as an idea for me to shoot, one of the things ir irresistible was the fact that I would be able to go to Scotland and fil film there because it's such a magical country, just wonderful visually. And uh, I'd always wanted to go there. I'd always wanted to work there. I'd never had the opportunity. Although it's a difficult territory because you do have very, very varied weather conditions, and that proved to be the case. At the very beginning of the movie, there's a battle between the two clans. Obviously, the McLeods and someone else, and the Kurgan appears. And the weather that day, we went from snow to sunlight to rain. It was just an incredible day, and it was June. I'd found this location again in a beautiful glen in Scotland, and we got all the locals from Fort William and all the towns around to come and fight. And it was pretty cold, and they're all in kilts and not wearing too much. And there was one guy who must have been about six foot four who looked magnificent in his kilt and his broadsword, a real Scotsman, red hair, big and stocky, even though he was quite tall. And at the end of filming, he wandered off singing away with his all his costume on and his sword. And he was last seen walking into the mist and no one dared stop him and ask him for the, the gear back. One of the things about this whole film, which as part of that decision to make um, such a fantasy element and such a vibrant film, meant that the ca our camera work was much more liberal than it would have been on an ordinary subject. And that involved using the Lumark Rain, a mechanical device for putting the camera into positions where you, you're inhibited by the difficulty of placement. But the Lumar, which is a French design by a man called Lavaloupe, and the Lumark Rain was used frequently. It gives you an endless extension of possibilities. One particular shot, uh, where we are above the Kurgan on the horse, on his horse, we have the Lumar crane arm, and the sun comes out at the beginning of the shot, and you see the crane arm moved out, and you know it didn't matter because it was just a, like another mad element. It was just a black shadow, sort of sharp shape shadow going across. It was a, it belonged to his apparition, you know, on a, on a horse. Well, normally on a film, you would have to re would have had to have another take on that, at least because you'd you'd have to recover that. You say, oh, there was something wrong with that shot, but it, because the concept of the that um, that thing, it worked. And gradually, you've you know, you then you talk to the DP about how he might light it, whether he likes backlight or side light or what is how he sees it should be lit and then I like to incorporate the windows into sketches. I do rough sketches, then I do sort of fairly large scale models so we can sit around and work out how it's going to be. And then obviously on every film there you have to work to a budget so I don't know what the budget was for the loft but it's very specific so it might be say $50,000 to build the loft and 10000 for the dressings. So you have to build it, you can't obviously build a million dollar loft you have to work within the budget as well. So you can gradually refine it down and refine it down and then obviously the choice of colours and the choice of furnishings try to reflect the character in the script. Uh, so it's a gradual process and it's rather like, I always like to think of it as painting a picture. You know, you, you, when you want to paint a picture you have some idea what you want to achieve at the end but you modify it gradually and as forms and colours evolve and the gradually the thing becomes more concrete. We built McLeod's apartment, by, obviously I'd scouted, I'd got lots of books on New York lofts and we'd, I believe we'd already scouted New York so I'd taken some pictures of lofts in New York and we built, and we built it based on an amalgam of different pictures that we liked and Russell and myself had sat down and said well that would be good for McLeod, it should look like this and then obviously I like to talk to the Christopher then and say 
you know, what would you what would you like there that you know your character is there anything specific you might have in there as a character i showed him the model of what his apartment would look like and he liked the sort of feel of a big open New York loft with the elevator and the big central staircase. And I think he'd done it as pop promo and said, do you think this would work? It was arranged by, again, a contribution by the art department, the art director, by making an aquarium of the sufficient size for us to be within the, the borders of it and could be make a movement through it. A, rise, a rising movement and we duplicated that rising movement in a box which we sunk in the, so we wanted to have enough space to be able to rise up through the surface of the water and we had to then in the editing make sure that we edited the the, the similar line in the tank which we took on location with a glass front so in one case we're outside the aquarium and in the next case we were inside the aquarium looking out. But because the two were similar to backgrounds and because of the movement of the water was sufficiently indeterminate that uh, we were able to link the two elements. And once again we, tra we passed from this century back three or four centuries. Well, one, as I say, said before, one of the great things about a designer, being a designer, is you get to scout all these wonderful locations. And uh, in, in Highlander in particular, scouting up and down the West Coast and the Highlands of Scotland was fantastic. But one of the great sequences, I think, is when, uh, Rem when Ramirez is teaching MacLeod. We found this pinnacle where we helicoptered the two artists onto this rock sticking up like a almost like a thumb into the air. It's, it's absolutely essential in this kind of adventure, if one could call it that, on Highlander, required a very close cooperation between all departments, uh, and that includes actors as well. Um, but um, we need really to be completely combined as far as achieving the visual effects. And that, of course, Alan Cameron did a brilliant job. He not only did he provide the, the visual linkage, make him make it already more feasible, um, but he also had to build the various sets in very difficult conditions. Sometimes he overcame all of those. So uh, you know, I have to say, it was to, uh, all the work I did with him. A great deal of it was done before the picture started because I would be able to go to see him and look at the drawings so I'd know what I was coming up against as far as the um, physical limitations of the sets. Uh, he built the most magnificent, for example, on the Scottish mountain. He built Connor's home. And that was quite tricky from the construction point of view because we, when I scouted it with Tim Hutchinson, my art director, I remember the wind blowing and the rain pouring down and we were actually clinging onto rock so we didn't get blown over. And everyone thought we were mad to build it up there, but the, the aspect was so fantastic that it just had to be built there. And in the end, we were putting firing bolts into rocks to hold the keep down. And the construction boys did a really marvellous job even getting the material up there let alone building the castle up there. And then one of the interesting aspects from an art director's point of view is we see the keep complete, and then obviously after one of the battles, it gets destroyed and we see the, the finger of the stairs going up into the air, which we actually then had to take our castle down and rebuild it as the, as the wreck keep. And just down, slightly down the slope, we actually built the croft that later on after MacLeod has married Heather, I think her name is, he goes and lives in this little croft, so the two sets were pretty close together. The interior of, of MacLeod's keep was built in a fertiliser warehouse in Greenwich. We were going to build it originally in Twickenham Studios, but we needed the height, and I believe this place was about 60, 70 foot high, so we could actually build quite a large set in it. The structure of the wall had to be broken uh, broken up and disappear and to be able to do another take if necessary too. The set was built 
with Martin Gudridge was the special effects supervisor in combination with him we actually built the complete interior that he then blew apart and blew the walls out and so that the final fight takes place on this little staircase that the only part of the keep that remains and at the end of it they have uh, Sean Connery and the Kirk staircase falls away at the end of that so that was quite a challenge for both the art department and special effects so that whole thing was was very very inventive both on all sides you know that's one of the marvelous things about filmmaking i think you know to try and make a seamless seamless story happen so you, you film some in new york some in london some in scotland and then hopefully you, it all flows together and you don't realize that we would actually shot an exterior for example of the croft in scotland and the interior was shot in jacob street and we found this alleyway, which we dressed up as a New York alleyway. So the Kurgan is attacking the person in the alleyway and all the windows again explode. And our special effects supervisor put jelly ignite in all the windows and explosion was so gigantic. The actual roof of the warehouse, the windows that were blowing actually lifted slightly. So that again was a mixture, a transition between London acting, playing as New York and New York for real. Jacob Street wasn't really a studio and it was it was quite I don't know what it had been previously some sort of warehousing and it you know normally when you go into a film studio it's a big open space and it's soundproofed this this wasn't properly soundproofed and there were columns down the middle of a lot of the stages which I had to incorporate into the design of the scenery so again this is one of the one of the interesting <laughs> aspects of designing that wherever you eventually end up filming you usually have to design around certain difficulties let's say. What was originally a cyanide factory built in the first well about 1914 and it was a building shaped like a beehive and the theory was that in those days we we're talking about the zeppelins and it was designed that bombs would bounce off off the roof. The roof was shaped like that. And any bomb hit it would, would bounce off. It was concrete. And we shot inside this thing. When I first got the script, the end sequence was actually set on the roller coaster on Coney Island. And I, th uh, and the whole roller coaster collapsed and it was, it was quite a major scene. But when we came to work out how we could do it, and we spent quite a lot of time working on that sequence, it was just far too expensive for the particular budget of the film. And we'd actually scouted New York already and Russell and myself had been driving across one of the bridges and we saw the Silver Cup in the distance. Now Silver Cup is a studio with the name up on the roof in a big hoarding, a bit like Hollywood, you know. And we both looked at each other and sort of said, mm, maybe we should stage it on that and the sign could fall down and things like that. Obviously it would be a lot cheaper but it could still be very exciting and dramatic and you know, so we kind of sat down together and Russell Russell said, well, what do you think we can achieve visually? Because in those days, there, it, it wasn't CG or you, you know, there was obviously visual effects and things, but the sort of processes you can do now just weren't available to us. Pretty hairy sequence because we could only do it once because the whole sign, obviously, in reality, it's a metal sign held up but so it would collapse we just built it out of plastic and the plastic had to be held up as I say by these ropes so if one guy let the rope go too soon the whole sign would have collapsed so when the numbers were being called out it was a gigantic window which all had explosive devices in every frame and a big translator New York outside that window and the fight continues across the floor with a vast quick tracking shot big translator in New York which is obviously backlit it was a night scene so that was reasonably easy to do we had a photographer go to New York and take photo plate photographs of Manhattan made it I think it must have been about 100 foot by 30 foot translite and in front of that I built another window which had panes of glass I think they were probably about two foot six by two foot six looking like a big factory window that stretched right across the whole warehouse and Martin put little explosive devices in each pane so that they all exploded. The tricky thing from his point of view was obviously, luckily everything went very well in the special effects in nearly all the scenes. There has been quite a change in technology. 
um, that's been driven, the, the driven by research and by development and by the improvement in technology, film, digital, the ability to be able to manipulate the image which couldn't be done earlier and yet of course they still tackled the subject matter. I don't like that this modern uh, technology domination so much because there's, a, there's no inventiveness you know um, and the audiences have come to sort of blasé really they, they expect an enormous number of uh, impossible vision and they are all impossible but they all they're all there you see them happening you know you, there isn't anything you can't do so they you know that makes it to me less interesting there is no sort of classical um, filmmaking it's it's all surrounding this techn technologically driven concepts of uh, visual excitement and it makes makes for what I see as being a chaotic and uh, much less meaningful and it's rather like um, or like a pop video you know it's pop video. and of course all that has arrived from advertising all the elements of which people dare to do um, going back to Highlander one can say what Russell Mulcahy wanted to do was right for that time. It hadn't existed before, but he did, did it and got away with it, and it, it worked as, an, as a way of making a movie. But you can't make every movie like that. I can remember years later I was doing a, a, a commercial down in Devon, and I, was, I went down like the, the advance party, and I'm sitting in this pub eating a meal, just a pub meal in the evening. And sort of vaguely listening to conversations in the background and I suddenly heard these kids role playing from Highlander so I couldn't resist it I actually had to go over and talk to them and they they were pretty amazed to actually talk to someone who worked on it so that was pretty fun and it, it, it's it, strangely enduring films people still remember it as a as a film that they really enjoyed even 20 years on people still talk about it mm -hmm.